Good morning, church. I invite you to stand with us. It's so good to be with you. And uh, today we worship spirit and truth. We worship Jesus. We fix our eyes on him this morning. We look to him as the way, the truth, the life. So we just steady our hearts this morning while we sing. Stay 
nations bow for all the world to know I'm living for your glory on the earth. We sing that again, this passion. This passion in my heart, this stirring in my soul to see the nations bow. seated. Oh man, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to be together at church. You guys should just do me a favor. Just look next to the person next to you and just let them know I've been waiting all week to sit next to you at church. I've been waiting all week to sit next to you at church. It's so good to be with you today. My name's Griffin, uh, for those of you that might not know. Um, and it's so good to be here. Grateful that we could share this Sunday together to worship Jesus, to listen to his word. And it's an exciting Sunday because we're actually starting a new series um, in the book of Genesis, exploring the life of Joseph. And um, we're going through a four-week series. And the series is called Divine Detours. It's called Divine Detours. And um, I remember just a couple weeks ago, I was, I was driving to meet a friend uh, for lunch. And on my way there, I saw a sign on the road that said, expect delays in bold orange lettering. And I'm, I'm like, I'm on time, but now I'm not on time to the place that I want to be in. And it's so true to life is that we have a plan, we have a desire, we have a direction for the things that we desire in our life. But oftentimes we find these detours, these things that delay us, these things that maybe even seemingly take us off of the track that we thought we were going in, the direction that we were going in. And oftentimes what God wants to show us is, is that the things that we define as detours are actually divine directions from God. 
that God oftentimes uses the things that we think are, are designed to destroy us or to derail us or distract us from the things that God has for us. Actually, it's in that moment, in that time, God wants to use that detour to actually show you his divine hand, his sovereign touch on your life. And so as we walk through this series together in these next few weeks, exploring the life of Joseph, I want us to lay a groundwork this morning on some of the characters and people that we're going to find in this story. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm all too aware that some of you might be familiar with some of the people in the life of Joseph. But this family that we're going to find and discover today in the passage is probably the most significant family, not only in the Bible, but really uh, across human history. This is one of the more important families, and we'll discover that together, why that is. But I want to talk to you today from a subject of a message called, and you're going to love this, this is going to be a really encouraging message today. The, the message title is Lessons from a Dysfunctional Family. <laughs> Can I get an amen in the house? <laughs> Some of you know what that looks like. I think that disclaimer, um, you, you, can't, you can't have a family without some dysfunction. Amen? <laughs> you can't have close proximity, relationships, people working together, and, 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 and close proximity, and, and it could get messy at times. The people that we live with and know, and when you're in close proximity and you know people to a deeper level and you see the good, the bad, and the ugly, hello, it can get messy. And, and what we see is that no family is exempt from dysfunction, and especially this one that we're going to look at this morning. And so I want us to be able to kind of glean and learn and, and look at what are some lessons that we can gather from chapter 37 and Genesis from this family, Jacob's family, and really the family that becomes the tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel, is birthed from this family. And so we're going to discover together today how God can take that dysfunction and turn it into something beautiful and good and helpful to all of us. So are you with me on that? Does that sound like a good plan today, this morning? Yes? Come on, give me a little more than that. All right, let's pray, and then we'll, we'll jump in. Father, oh, it's just good to be in your presence. I just want to acknowledge, Lord, that you're in the room, that where your people are, you are also there, Father. So we just declare that in faith today. We believe that in faith, that... Um, that this isn't just a, a room full of people and a mic and, and music, that, that your presence is here. Where your word is spoken, there's power. And so we don't want to take that for granted, God, and we also want to, want to feel the weight of that. And so we just acknowledge that this morning today, Lord. We love you. We praise you. And I pray this, that you would soften our hearts as we open your word, God, that you would open us up as we open your word. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said, Amen. So the first lesson that I want us to look at here from this dysfunctional family is the pitfall of favoritism. We're going to pick up in verse uh, 2 in chapter 37. We should have the scripture on the screen. It starts with this. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Pause for a moment. So we're exploring the life of Joseph, but we cannot understand Joseph until we have a clear picture of who Jacob is. So if you're familiar with the story of Genesis, uh, a, a core part of the story uh, in, in this narrative is Jacob. And Jacob holds a crucial place in God's plan for not just the people of Israel, but for all of humanity. And he's in his, him carrying out the covenant promises that were brought before him is instrumental in, in the development of this people group. And so he had a, a, a weighty call on his life and a weighty um, a destiny that God had put over his head. But with that weighty destiny is also a marred past in some ways. So his very name, for those of you that may not know, is Deceiver, Jacob. <laughs> 
So, but before, so before his, God had changed his name to Israel, his name was Jacob. And in God's faithfulness, he used Jacob's inability to be all that he was supposed to be to fulfill his purposes and his plans. And how many of you know that God sometimes will use you despite you? That God will use you despite your flaws and your failures and your shortcomings and your sin. God wants to use you. And that nothing can stop the call over your life when God has placed something inside of you for something significant. And so Jacob was a pivotal piece in the story of God. God loves using imperfect people for his plan. And so many people, they exempt themselves from God using them because they feel like they're not good enough. But then if you just open up the Bible and look, almost every significant person in the Bible that God used was either uneducated, an adulterer, a murderer, a liar, a deceiver. If God can use them, then he can use you now. And But so many people sidelight themselves from God's call and the weight that he has over your life. And so I love the the story of Jacob because there's so many future implications of and, and the importance of his life. And so you have to understand that Jacob w- 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 was marked by God for something more. And so Jacob held a crucial place in God's plan for humanity. So this is the story of Joseph, but the backdrop of the story of Joseph starts with the patriarch of this family, who is Jacob. And so this is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Silpha, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Tattletail, much. <laughs> now, Israel loved Joseph. Listen closely. Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. Some translations say it's a colorful robe. A lot of the depictions of this robe have been that it was this extravagantly expensive robe that his father, Jacob, placed on his son, Joseph. And can you even imagine just for a moment being one of his brothers is like, he got a coat, why can't I get a coat? Like he's got this beautiful coat and he's the only one out of all of his brothers who's gifted this from his father. So he had been, the reason why he had given this and he loved him more than his other sons is because he had been born to him in his old age. And so when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, They hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So so Jacob, his life exemplifies for us in many ways this great leader, this strong patriarch of a family, the cornerstone of a family that would be the nation that would birth the Messiah to not just the people of Israel, but to the world, that the descendant uh, uh, of of the Messiah would come from this line. And so Jacob's life was so important, but he had this pitfall that we see in this story. And he does the very same thing that his own father did to him. See, previous chapters before this in Jacob's account of his life, we see that his father, Isaac, favored his brother Esau over Jacob. And, 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 and so we see that as a, as a pivotal part of this story is that Jacob not only uh, walks through that, that season of his life, but many years goes by and he does the same exact thing that his own father did to him. There's this pitfall of, of favoritism, this pitfall of, of, of showing partiality and, and, and love to one person over another, one, a sense of affection to, to uh, your own son over the other sons. It's, and it's so incredible how oftentimes people become so obsessed with become, not becoming one thing that they end up actually over time becoming the very thing that they hated or the very thing that destroyed them or the very thing that hurt them the most in their own childhood. I wonder how many people even in this room can resonate with that. 
is that maybe your own father, your own mother treated you in a certain way. And the thing that just destroys you as a kid is the very same thing that you wrestle with and how you treat the people and put close proximity in your world today. And so oftentimes we, we carry on generations of past hurt and pain and sin. And, and it's difficult to be the person to say, no, this actually stops with me. This actually, this ends here. This is, I'm not going to carry on this destructive pattern of alcoholism. I'm not going to carry on this, this abusive way of speaking to one another. I'm not going to carry on these patterns that are destroying our family. And, and we see this all over scripture is that there's a person, there, there are typically two types of people. There's the person that stops the generational sin, and then there's the person that perpetuates it. That, 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 that continues it or actually even fuels it even more so. And then Jacob, with all of his flaws and all of his strengths and all of his goodness and, and some of the more ugly areas of his life, and he did many great things in his life, this is one of his pitfalls, was that he couldn't overcome the sin of his father. Is that the sin of his father was something that he, he decided to not stop but actually perpetuate in his own life. And the strife and the lack of unity and the discord, the ripple effect that favoritism has in a family or even in the church of, of God or, or in, even in a workplace is so destructive. You've seen it in your own life. Maybe you've been on the other end of that where you've watched someone else receive a sense of love or affirmation or attention or gifts, hello, that you didn't receive, and it makes you start to wonder and resent and, and, and it creates a, a wall of bitterness and a wall of offense between you and that person. And so the result of favoritism and, is strife and division and discord. And we start to see these seeds being planted in this family from the patriarchs, from the father's sin that he was unwilling to stop. And I'm sure at some point along the way, we could assume that, that Jacob didn't intend, obviously we never intend on doing the things that, that, that ultimately hurt or destroy the people around us. Oftentimes people, they just are doing the best they can. But I could imagine Jacob did not intend on planting these seeds in his sons of going, oh my goodness, now they hate Joseph. <laughs> I could imagine that, that he never started out to, to want to fall into this favoritism. But somewhere along the, le along the way, something stopped him. Now, I remember growing up, I was in Boy Scouts. And, you know, when they taught us how to use a compass with a map, um, it, a, a part of uh, them teaching us that w was... Uh, the, is letting us know that there is only really one thing that can stop a compass from pointing to the direction it's supposed to point. And it's when it's an external force uh, that's around it, whether it's a magnetic force or over time it being um, hindered. But an external agent or, of a magnetic force that could cause it to point in the wrong direction. And it could start to hinder it over time. And so I really believe that even with Jacob and even with ourselves, oftentimes we've, we, we, we can get in these moments where we have an internal compass that wants to point in the right direction, but there are external forces that oftentimes, more than not, could point us in the wrong direction. And these external forces, whether they be past experiences or our own pain or our own suffering or our own sin, starts to distort and redirect us in the wrong place. And Here's the thing about the compass is that in order to get it back to pointing in the correct direction, you need, you need to recalibrate it. You need to recalibrate the compass. And so many people spend their whole lives and they don't realize that they have a broken compass. <laughs> they don't realize that they're being misdirected by their own internal framework. And so I just want to encourage you today, how many times in your own life 
whether on a daily or weekly basis, are you able to recalibrate and look honestly about the way that you treat the people in your world and your family? And, and to be honest about our blind spots, to be honest about our own things that shape the way that we treat other people. And you know, and here's the thing, it might not have been your fault. See, it wasn't Jacob's fault that his father favored his brother Esau over him, but it was now his responsibility to make sure that he wouldn't do the same thing to his own sons. And so it might not have been your fault the way that your own father hurts you. It might not have been your own fault about how your best friend betrayed you or hurt you or, or someone close to you, how they, they betrayed your trust, but it is your responsibility to make sure that you don't carry that same hurt onto the people around you. And so the pitfall of favoritism is that we could fall into it even sometimes without even knowing it. And so that's the first lesson that I want to share with us today is this warning against favoritism. And the Bible is so, so very clear on this. In James chapter 2, it says this, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Why? Because when you love people well, everyone's on the same playing field. When you're loving people in a sacrificial, real, honest way, everyone's on the same playing field. Everyone's in the same game. We're all at the same level. I'm not better than you. The person, is, you're not below me. We can see eye to eye. I'm not going to look down at you. I'm not going to mistreat you because I think this person deserves love more than this person does. No, we're going to strive together as a family, whether in the family of God or we're in our actual immediate family, our friend circles to go. Now, I'm not going to show favoritism. I'm actually going to go out of my way to the people who who are even exiled in a group or excommunicated or mistreated, the people who become afterthoughts. So I just want to encourage us today. I know that it can be a heavy topic is like, man, the weight of past generational sins and the patterns that we find ourselves so entangled with can be daunting at times. But I want to encourage you today that we have a choice whether or not to fall into this pitfall. So that is, I think, the, the first lesson that we can see is it's just the pitfall of, of favoritism from the life of Jacob. But we continue on in the passage. And the second lesson that I believe that we can glean from this passage is this, is the cost of divine favor. The cost of divine favor. We'll pick back up in verse 5. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. At this point, I would have just been like, I'm going to stop you right there, chief. Baby, don't share this dream. He continues on. <laughs> I had another dream. And this time, the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And when he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. You see, there's a cost to divine favor, and we're going to see exactly what that cost is on Joseph's life as we uncover more of the story. But the truth is this, is that everyone wants favor from God, but nobody wants what it costs. Everybody wants purpose, but they don't want to actually endure the pain that purpose costs. The pressure that there is in living in alignment with God's purpose and dream and calling that there is in your life. See, Joseph is your prototypical golden boy. <laughs> and he's favored. He's favored not just by his father, but he's favored by God. 
and, and meaning that God, God had a special, a unique call on his life. And the truth is this, is that God not only had a call on Joseph's life, but on the call of his brothers as well. His was just unique. It was different. Different doesn't mean better, and different doesn't mean worse when it comes to God's calling. It just means that his was unique. And so some of you right now, and you, and you look at Joseph, he was so excited to share the dreams that God had for him. <laughs> he was so exi- excited. He didn't even probably even fully know what the dreams meant. He didn't understand the weight of the dream that God had given him. And some of you can relate to that to a certain extent. Maybe you have something that God's pressed on your heart, a desire that you have, a dream that you have, a vision of the future that you believe is not just from your imagination, but has been to some extent inspired or encouraged by God or from the people of God. And so the question is, is what do you do while you're waiting to see the thing that you're believing in your heart? And the problem is, is that Joseph believed God on his thing so much that he prematurely is sharing the message to the people around him without even fully understanding, A, what it is, and B, the road that it was going to bring him on. And there's a sense of almost naive nature and unawareness to Joseph in this moment. But there's a real cost to to living and following the favor of God and the call of God on your life. You could even liken it in some ways to an uncut gemstone. Maybe some of you have seen what that looks like. But Joseph's life is so much, in in many ways at this point in time, very similar to this, full of potential but rough around the edges, undefined. That there's a brilliance of the stone here, a beauty, and something there hidden beneath the layers. And all it needs is to be polished. All it needs is to be cut and stripped and shaped in some way in order to see what's underneath. And the problem is, is when you try to present something before it's ready and purified and and able to, to actually be presented in its purest form, what happens is people reject it. And that's what's happening in this moment here. He's prematurely sharing and immaturely sharing a dream that God had given him. And maybe some of you can relate to this. I can in some ways where I'm just like so excited about what God's doing in my life. And I'm just want, I want to share with other people or I'm prematurely going ahead of God. And what God wants you to do is not to go ahead of him, but to wait on him while he's working and to trust him and to not be passive. Waiting isn't passive. It's an active faith and listening to God as he's leading the way. But the truth is, is that some of you might be in a season right now where God is refining you, where he's pruning you, where he's cutting and removing some of the things that are on the surface in order to get to a place of purification. And see, this process, this journey can be painful at times. (laughs) It could be a painful journey where you're just going, God, when does this end? Like, I feel like I, I, I finished my purification process, God. Like, I, I think I'm ready to be presented. I, I think I'm ready to see the actualization of some of the dreams of some of the things that you've put on my heart. But God goes, oh, no, I'm actually going to, I'm going to actually send you through the fire one more time here. I'm going to, I'm going to send you through this situation to see how you respond. Or I'm going to send you through this time so you can go through some trial and some testing and And so you could trust me through something a little deeper and see, it's a lonely road at times. It's a narrow road, learning and striving to be set apart for the sake of Christ and following God. It's a lonely journey. And so I think one of the things that we can learn from Joseph, even in this moment here is, is, and I think this is really an important, an important distinction is discerning between because I think a lot of people, they can read a story like this and go, oh, man, God's put a dream on my heart, and i got to make it happen. And I've seen a lot of people ruin the relationships around them because of a dream that God had given them or a vision that God had given them. And see, what you want to make sure is that the dream that you're actually having isn't your human imagination, but it's actually a vision or a dream or an inspiration or an encouragement or some kind of... Um, inspiration from God and from God's people and is verified in God's word. 
And so it's, there's an importance between discerning God's dream, his call on your life, the vision that he has for your life, versus your own human imagination or your own selfish ambition. <laughs> and we can get that confused sometimes in our own immaturity. We can get that confused sometimes in our own striving or in our own wanting to have our, our own hand on our future. And not everyone is ready or able to understand the extent of God's call on their life. Maybe you've rejected it. I remember for me, for most of my life, for most of the last, really the last chapter of my life, I'm being honest with you, I spent a lot of time wrestling with God. A lot of time rejecting, God, I don't know if you want this for me. I think I'd rather want it to be that. <laughs> Trying to negotiate with God. And some of you today, you need to stop negotiating with God and you need to seriously and honestly and sincerely submit to his will over yours. And it's not always going to look comfortable. It's not going to always be easy. And it might not even be fully sensible to the people around you at times. And so there's a real cost and there's a real weight to the divine favor of following God. Favor doesn't mean that everything's easy. Favor doesn't mean that, and following God doesn't mean that everything's going to come so easily to you. And so the third lesson that I want to share with you today is this. And this is huge. I think this will strike a chord with almost everybody in the room. Is the corrosive power of envy and really the danger of comparison. So we pick back up in, in verse 18. They saw him. In the distance, his brothers. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. <laughs> these, just for a moment, th these brothers have been brought to such the low such a lowly place of envy and comparison that it brought to them to the point of wanting to murder their own brother. And now you might not have experienced envy and comparison to the extent and weight of this scenario, but the truth remains is that the only result of envy and comparison is really the destruction of our own integrity and our own purity and the own path of purpose that is on our own life. And so envy... I'd like to liken envy in, in many ways to, to rust that eats at the core of who we are. Proverbs 14 illustrates this in a very interesting way. It says this, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. So just as, as rust weakens metal over time, eventually envy gradually destroys your character, your relationships, and your sense of security. Envy happens when you're not secure in who you are in Christ. It rots you to your bones. It corrodes the core of who you are. And this is the act of intentionally and gradually destroying yourself over time. And we see the result of this in their life. And it's, it's, it's just this idea of like, if only if my life looked like this person, if only I had the favor that they have, if only I had the house that they had, the money they had, the job that they had, the family they had, fill in the blank, then I would be happy. See, envy can be pretty sneaky at times. A lot of people maybe defensively are like, oh, I'm not envious, I don't compare. Please. <laughs> Everyone naturally compares. Comparison isn't a sin. It's when comparison births envy, that's when it becomes destructive. So you can compare yourself to someone and still be content. I can compare myself to someone that's in close proximity to me, but still feel content in who I am in my own skin. It's when you look at somebody's life and you feel insignificant or you feel like, oh, man, if only I could exchange places with them, then my life would be better. That's when envy takes birth in our life. If only I had fill in the blank. And so I... I recently, uh, I've experienced this honestly in a very real way recently. It's been super humbling. I, uh, I recently started running again 
because I'm a crazy person. And um, I don't know why. Every time I run, I like the first mile, I'm like, why am I doing this? You know, this is like, I don't know why people willfully do it. But at the end, I decided to do it again. But when I started running again recently, what I realized is that I was constantly comparing myself to the people around me. I'd be running on a track or outdoors, and I see the people around me, and someone's running faster than me. I start picking up speed, running at a pace I can't run at. I'll go on social media, and I'll see people, and they'll post their splits, their time for you know, one mile, two mile, three miles, four miles, five miles. I'm like, how are they even running this fast? How is this even possible? And the truth is, is that there will always be somebody that's faster than you, there will always be somebody that can go at a pace that you can't go at currently. And you have to choose, am I going to run my own race? Am I going to, am I going to run the, my own journey that God's put in front of me? Or am I going to try and get in somebody else's lane? <laughs> am I going to try and prove something to the people around me because I'm striving for something that I'm not? It could be really, it could be really tempting to try and speed up your own process or run a race that isn't yours when you're constantly inundated with the progress of other people. As we live in this world and this society, it was like every time I pick up my phone, everyone's showing me the highlight version of themselves. Everyone's showing me the best version of who they are constantly. And then I have to, and then we all do collectively, have to somehow filter that through our own context and go, but I just had this really bad thing happen to me or I just got this bad report or this news and this person's life looks great, but what you don't know is the hidden sin or the hidden secret or the hidden pain that they're walking through personally. And so envy is such a trap because it doesn't show us the full extent of the other person's personal experience, what they're walking through. And see, what, what, what helps me the most with combating envy, and I believe it can help you too, is knowing that contentment and gratitude are the only antidotes to this problem. Is that it's really difficult to be envious and jealous of the people around me when I'm constantly in a state of gratitude. And it, it, it's, it's like a superpower. It's really unbelievable, actually. Is, is learning how to be grateful and thankful. And I love the words of Paul. He said, I've learned how to be content in all circumstances. Have you learned that skill? Is that whether, whether you have a lot or a little, whether God's blessed you with a ton or you're working only with a little bit in your hands, what have you done with what God has given you? And are you grateful for that thing? Because the reality is, is that we're only here for a little bit of time, and our true reward and our true heart goal and, and desire is to be with Christ in eternity. In light of eternity, the afflictions that we deal with, the pain that we deal with is so temporary. And so what I've just learned is, man, whether I got a lot or a little, whether things are going great on the outside or it's a struggle, and I feel like I'm just sludging through the season that I'm in, I'm going to be grateful. I'm, gonna, I'm going to intentionally write down what I'm grateful for. I'm going to be content because I know that if Christ, if Christ died for me on a cross and rose again so that I might have life, I got nothing to complain about. I got nothing to complain about because the God of the universe loved me so much that he would lay down his life for me so that I not only would have life, but life abundantly. And so if I'm walking with him, if I'm in step with him, what do I have to fear? What, what am I lacking in? I lack no thing if I have everything in Christ. And so do you believe that today? Do you have that, that, that framework, that mindset in your heart and in your world? And it looks a lot different because you respond to bad news differently. You respond to other people doing great or, or even living in the life that you want to live differently. When your heart is calibrated with contentment. When, you're, when, you're, when your mind has a fr framework of gratitude, 
This is why I think it's so important that, you know, you don't have to do this, but I personally do this. Man, if I don't write down what I'm, grat- what I'm grateful for, what I'm thankful for, what I'm praying for, what I'm, then I'm, that's, that's what gets me out of calibration. <laughs> that's, what, that's what gets me out of a real equilibrium, a, a, a real understanding of like, okay, I don't have anything to worry about. I, I don't need to worry about what other people are doing. I'm, I'm just focused on the journey that God has for me. I'm just doing the best I can with what I got, <laughs> you know? And, and, and when you start to become focused on that, the weight of the world falls off your shoulders. And so I just wonder for you today, maybe, you know, you, you're here and you're feeling that weight. And I'm just praying, man, that that would be released to you to some extent, that you wouldn't fall into this corrosiveness, this power of envy, but that you would actually feel the easiness of contentment, of, of just walking with Jesus. Jesus is my everything. So if Jesus is my everything, I lack nothing in my life. Run your own race. And so the last, are y'all still with me? We're doing okay? All right, good. The last, uh, the last lesson I want to share with you this morning is this, is the danger of self-preservation. The danger of self-preservation. We pick back up and in the scripture, it says this. When Reuben heard this, this is the eldest brother, Reuben. He has the protector, guardian, older brother attitude and archetype over himself. So when he heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands, Joseph. And let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. That doesn't really sound like a great alternative, but okay. <laughs> They're like, he's like, don't kill him, just throw him in a cistern instead. What? Like, what in the world? Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. And then skip back to verse 29. When Reuben returned to the cistern, and saw that Joseph was not there. He tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? So Reuben was the eldest son, and he was caught in this moment in an act of, and really this web intention of self-preservation and appeasement. He's trying to walk the tightrope between doing what's right and keeping the peace with his brothers. But here's the hard truth, is when you're driven by fear and the need to save your own face, you end up compromising your own integrity and failing to do the first thing that you wanted to do in the beginning. And see, contextually, you need to understand Reuben wanted to save Joseph not out of, out of an act of righteousness or goodness. He wanted to save Joseph because previous chapters before, you can read it for yourself, he had dishonored his father in a pretty grave way. And so he was in bad terms with his father. And this is him not trying to save his brother's life, but to selfishly, in his own ambition, save himself. And so we can't really sugarcoat it here. Reuben wasn't protecting his brother. He was self-preserving his own motives. He knew what they, were, what they were planning was wrong, but instead of standing up with a sense of conviction, he tried to play it safe. He says, let's not kill him. But his motive wasn't courage or righteousness. It was fear. Fear of losing his brother's respect. Fear of not being approved by his own father. I mean, I don't know about you, but I just really believe we're living in a time and an era and a season where people in the church need to have courage. 
Courage to be able to distinguish between what's right and wrong. Courage to be able to say, no, this isn't a gray issue. This is a black and white issue. No, this isn't about, oh, but my opinion. This is about God's truth. This is about standing in grace and truth. And man, I just wish that there would be a group of people that would rise up within the church today to start vocalizing the truth of God to this culture, to start vocalizing the truth of God in the face of of evil and in the face of darkness. I I think there's so much we can learn from Reuben in this moment is when we become so focused on our own selfish ambition and our own inward desires and needs, what we actually end up doing is missing out on the very thing that we wanted to do in the first place, which is to please our father. See, if he had just stood in courage and just said, no, what you're doing is wrong, we actually have to save him. He could have saved his brother and appeased his father. But yet he tried to have it both ways, to appease his brother and please his father and to walk this tightrope of of insecurity and trying to to please the people around him. And then you got to know, If you're going to be courageous and stand for something in your life, there are going to be people that are going to disagree with you. (laughs) Newsflash. If you're going to follow Christ in this culture, in this climate, in the time that we're living in, if you, want to, if, you, if you want to stand for something in your family and in your world, there are going to be people that disagree with you. And you, and see, listen, indecision is, an, is a decision. Indecision about who you are, what you stand for, what you believe in this time is a decision of compromise. It was for Reuben, and it is for us as well. And so I just, I believe that we're living in a time where Christians need to learn again what it means to be courageous. It doesn't mean that we have a big mouth or we're rude or we're brash or we're insensitive to the people around us. It means that we're light and darkness. It means that we're salt of the earth, that we preserve goodness in our world. We preserve goodness in in in, in the public space and and in our life and in our relationships, that there's something that is distinct about us. Courage is about standing out when everyone else is standing on the sidelines. It's about when you're in the workplace and you don't talk the way that everybody talks. You don't conduct yourself in the same way with your circle of friends that, that, that the majority does. That the way that you do your business and the way that you live your everyday life resembles Christ in such a beautiful way that people are drawn to that thing. Whether they like it or not, they're going to be drawn to it. But I'm telling you, it's going to take a sense of courage rising up in the people of God to start standing up and, and, and not straddling the fence of compromise, which eventually leads to disaster, but actually living in in the will of God with courage. So Reuben's behavior in this scenario and the scene shows us the dangers of cowardice in the face of conflict. Instead of standing firm in your beliefs, or instead of standing for what's right and, 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 and worrying about the consequences of that thing later on, and, not, and, and, and navigating it in a way that resembles something good. I love this C.S. Lewis quote. I think this is so profound. He says, courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point. Whew, that's really good. Now preach. See, he's suggesting that virtues like honesty or integrity or compassion or justice, not social justice, but justice are not truly tested until we face a situation where acting on them requires a sense of courage. So, so honesty is easy when telling the truth has no negative consequences. It requires courage when the truth might lead to like a personal loss or, or some kind of consequence. 
And so ask yourself the question is what do you do when you come to the place of a testing point? Whether it be in your interpersonal relationships or your work or your life, what do you do when you're faced with a crossroad? Do I step into the courage or do I step away from it? Do I lean in or do I run away? There's a real cost to seeking the approval of other people. And the honest truth is, is that when we're constantly seeking the approval of other people and the, the opinions of the populace, we end up never stepping into real courage and conviction. And it really just challenges us. It's been cha- challenges me, even reading this passage, is just examining in my own life. It's like, man, are there any places in my life, are there any conversations that I'm not willing to have with people because I just don't have the, car- the courage to have it? Maybe some of you are dealing with that right now. Maybe there's some conversations that you need to have with people that are just, they're not rude or, or mean or harsh, but it's going to take a little courage and grace and truth for you to have that conversation with that person, whether it be in your family or, or someone in your close proximity. I mean, it's going to take courage to not compromise. And so Reuben decides to do the opposite. He decides to, to, to not lean in, but to, to step away and to shy away from, from really standing for what's right. And the result is his brother is thrown into a pit Thrown into, and then he's sold on into slavery. And I just got to wonder for Joseph, he's laying in a pit. And he's got to be thinking, he's like, man, is this over for me? <laughs> like, I just had all these dreams that God put in my heart. These things that I felt like God was speaking to me on. I spoke, I spoke so boldly about it. But here I am, and the results of my life do not look like the dreams and the visions that I once had about what God was going to do. Have you ever been there before? Where your circumstances don't look like what you were once believing for. And that's the moment where not only does your back hit the wall, but you're tested in faith to trust that. The thing that you see with your eyes closed, the healing of your own marriage, the breakthrough the, the breaking of a destructive pattern in your life, whatever it is, the thing that you're waiting for it, it is not only going to happen in time, but it happens while your eyes are closed and you're stuck in a place that you have no control over. Joseph didn't have control over his circumstance in this moment. And so, man, what it just makes you wonder is like, man, what is God's plan in times where the problem is so prevalent, it's so in your face? It's like, God, I have nothing else to do but to release control to you. I have nothing else to do but to just say, okay, God. And sometimes God will put us in this place where we have no choice. Have you ever been there before? Where you have no choice but to trust God. (laughs) It's like, all right, Lord, I'm going to trust you in a deeper way than I ever have before. I'm going to rely on your grace. I'm going to seek you in ways that I never have before, because if I don't, I don't want to go backwards. God, if I don't trust you, if I don't see you come through in this way, God, in the meantime, I I don't know what else to do. And then you look at this family and there's so many levels of dysfunction, right? (laughs) You'd be almost discouraging to look at. (laughs) And you ask the question is like, what, what is God's plan for dysfunctional families, right? And we would, and I think we see it really clearly here, and I want to end on this thought and just invite the the team up, is in Hebrews chapter, or Romans chapter 8 says this, is that the firstborn, and this is talking about Jesus, he's the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And in Hebrews chapter 2, it says, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. God's plan for dysfunctional families was and still is to send his perfect son as the elder brother. God's plan for 
sinful, broken humanity was to send his son so that there might be hope, not just in the temporary, but for the eternal. So that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but that they would have eternal life. And man, I just want to encourage you, maybe some of the dysfunction that you've been experiencing in your life is so overwhelming. I just want to, I want to encourage you today and invite Jesus to radically change the way that your family operates. And it starts with you. It starts with every single one of us resembling the elder brother, Jesus, to sacrifice in ways that we wouldn't normally do, to overlook an offense of somebody else in ways instead of harboring bitterness or or resentfulness or slandering that person, to, to like Jesus, cover them with grace, to cover them with mercy. I love that Jesus is the elder brother because he sets the example for the rest of the family. (laughs) He sets the example for all of us in the family of God. So we just encourage you with that today. I want to pray for every single one of you. and We'll finish with some worship. Jesus, um, we just thank you that you laid it all down for us, that you didn't just die on a cross, Lord, but that you rose again, that you're still living today, God. And I pray that the reality of your love would change our families, would change our churches, would radically change the way that we live our lives. And Father, we just we just say today, even right now, we trust you. We trust you, Lord. We trust your plan. We trust your providence. We trust your sovereignty. Even in tumultuous times, Lord, these are some pretty crazy times we're living in. <laughs> And we just say that we trust you despite all that. We love you so much, Jesus. We pray all these things in your mighty name. And all God's people said, amen. We can stand. We're going to sing one more time.
make something beautiful out of me. Well, we love you guys. We invite you to um, just be blessed on the rest of your Sunday. We love you. We uh, excited to see you next week. We're going to continue in our series, Divine Detours. So we encourage you to come back and love you guys. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday.